Thank you, everybody, for your time today. We are here with one of our community partners, Quota Path, bringing you a webinar to learn why 90% of leaders don't trust their compensation structure. So um, we have Ryan Milligan, Chief of Staff, and Graham Collins. I got that wrong. Senior right. Director of RevOps, Ryan Milligan. It's right there in front of me. And uh, Graham Collins, Chief of Staff. Um, they put together a um, 2022 compensation trends report, which should do a lot to help you plan your uh, comp plan for 2023. Uh, you'll also learn the benefits of standardizing your comp plans, how your quota to OTE ratio and based variable splits compare to today's numbers, and hopefully leave with a new comp plan customized to your own organization. So, um, I'm going to turn it over to you guys for a sec. Uh, a couple of housekeeping items. This event will be recorded and uh, it'll live on our website after this. So you guys can catch up with it later. Um, feel free to put questions in the Q&A section in the chat throughout the event. Also feel free to use the chat the entire time. Um, it's there for us to use. We will answer questions throughout the event and leave a little time afterwards. Um, and I believe that's it. Actually, no, if you are not part of the RevOps co-op community yet, we have almost 7,000 people that love RevOps in the community. You can join right there. And now I'm done. I'll let you guys take it away. Excellent. Thank you. Um, wonderful. I'll go ahead and pull my screen up. Pull up the, uh, the slide deck there. Just confirm, Ryan, we're, we're good on the slide deck. You can see that? Absolutely. Wonderful. For some reason with this, it doesn't actually show me what I'm sharing. So that's all right. I have to guess and assume that it's up there. Um, perfect. Well, yeah. So we're going to be talking through sales compensation trends for 2023 today. Um, I will kick it over to Ryan to give a quick introduction on himself and, and what makes him a, an expert. I, I feel like we might should put quotes around that, but uh, what, what makes you an expert on, on sales comp? Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Ryan Milligan, uh, based in the Philly area, lead RevOps here at Quotapath. I uh, have been in a variety of kind of marketing ops and RevOps and analytics roles over the past 10 plus years. Uh, expert is a uh, is a vague <laughs> term. I've designed a lot of comp plans in, in my day and have talked to a lot of people about comp plans. Uh, and love the the analytics and the math behind comp plans. Spent a lot of time in Excel, uh, and then eventually moving over to Quota Path, which has been much much better for that for me. And um, so yeah, we're happy to be here and uh, happy to chat. Yeah, and for those who don't know, Ryan, will you give your best uh, Quota Path pitch as to to what it is that we do? Sure. Uh, Quota Path is a commission tracking and payout platform. Uh, effectively, what we try to do is meet everybody where they are in the commissions process. So. Uh, finance to be able to calculate and pay commissions, uh, rev ops to help with comp plan design, and then the, the often left out person in the room, sales and the individual uh, sales reps to have visibility into their commission tracking, uh, the ability to forecast what they're going to earn. So we try to, we try to best solve for the triangle of people who are the power triangle involved in commission tracking, uh, finance, rev ops, and sales all in one. Excellent. Thank you. Um, and I'm Graham Collins. I'm chief of staff at Quotapath. I, uh, have had a lot of different roles at Quotapath, sales, some, some rev ops before Ryan got here. I tell people I do a job until we hire someone who's better at it than I am. And so that's why Ryan is here to, to run uh, rev ops. And uh, a major function of my role is that I sit down and help sales leaders, rev ops, finance leaders build their comp plans. So I've done almost 500 comp plan consults at this point. Um, if you are interested in sitting down and learning more about your comp plan and how what I think of it, Feel free to uh, book some time on my calendar. That's on our website uh, at quotapath.com. So what are we talking about today? So uh, we alluded to it earlier, but we ran a survey earlier this year, uh, a couple of months ago, where we asked over 300 people working in sales, rev ops, and finance, about 75% in SaaS, about 85% in North America, but asked them a whole bunch of questions about their comp plans. Uh, not just the structure of their comp plans, not just you know what your base variable split is, that's that's important. But we also asked about rep motivation, who owns comp plans, and how much you you trust those comp plans. And why is because sales compensation is important and it's it's actually often 
under understood. Um, it drives revenue and is pivotal for hiring and retaining top talent, but oftentimes it's just a guessing game. And so we wanted to provide some hard numbers, how other folks are doing it and how we think it is the best way to, to do it. So let's talk through some of the, the survey results. So this is one of my favorite slides here, which is that there is a lack of trust in sales compensation across sales ops, across finance and, um, and across sales. Sales, rev ops, finance. So um, a few key statistics, 90% of sales leaders don't trust their sales comp structure. We'll talk a little bit about that and how you can remedy that. 44% of sales reps aren't motivated by their comp plans. 75% of sales reps don't trust that they're paid fairly. And 80% of companies have paid reps wrong or have, have admitted to incorrectly paying their reps. Um, Ryan, I'll mostly be running through kind of the statistics here and then and then yeah. having Ryan for, for his input on it. I don't know. Is, is there one of these that is um, extra surprising to you or or I guess not surprising at all to you? Uh, the last two are definitely the scariest. I mean, if you think about if, you know, if the majority of reps want to motivate or be motivated by comp, right? The other question is, what percentage of people want to be motivated by comp, it's probably, you know, 100% um, versus the number that- There's a stat here at the end that's that's uh, pretty similar to that. So yeah, we'll, exactly. we'll, we'll get to that, but yeah. And so, to, and so to me, like RevOps, the role of RevOps in an org is entirely about trust, right? You're supporting your revenue operations, your, your marketing team, your sales team, and your CS and account management team to like build processes that make it better for them to do their jobs. And so if you don't pay them correctly and you lose trust from your reps, then how are they going to trust you when you're building an outbound process for them? How are they going to trust you when you're uh, thinking about territory design? How are they going to trust you for round robins? Like, so to me, the reps not trusting and being paid incorrectly, like if we were to run into that consistently here, our reps wouldn't trust my team, which would just be wholly damning for my relationship with our sales team moving forward. Yeah, for sure. And the and the relationship between rev ops and sales i mean up until recently it was always sales ops and now it's yeah. become rev ops which we can talk more about but um it's an incredibly important relationship one of the most important relationships so um cool well so just a quick heads up everybody we will dive deeper into this at the end but i wanted to at least tease uh compensation hub so we are we have a, a tool that we just launched on october 4th called compensation hub we took a lot of the learnings from this survey and a lot of the learnings that we've had from those 500 plus calls that i've done and all of our customers and built out some of the most trusted and transparent comp plans um, and give you the ability to actually model it and model those plans based on specifics about your business so I will, uh, I will certainly talk more about it, but um, it is at comp.quotapath.com if you want to pull that up and then come right back to me. Um, don't, don't go anywhere. I feel like uh, I'm, I'm going to a commercial break, but stay in your seats. Um, so from that survey, uh, I always like to talk about the average comp plan. Now, this comes up a lot. You know, what's, what's the average SaaS comp plan? What's the average comp plan? There's no two comp plans are exactly unique, but when we think about it from this survey, business is SaaS, like we saw about 75% was from SaaS. Base salaries are 50% of the OTE, OTE being your on-target earnings. The quota period is quarterly based on ARR and is between four and seven X your OTE. And now this is going to be, don't worry, we'll dive deep into each of these. Um, and then it has accelerators based on quota attainment, but it doesn't change based on product sold or contract length. Created by sales leadership in the early stage, RevOps in the later stage, and it's rolled out early. A kind of a self-serving um, stat there of eight hours. The finance or accounting team spends about eight hours on average per month to calculate commissions. I so, paid our team comp. I paid our team comp in twenty minutes uh, yesterday. So a nice, little, a nice little plug for eight hours. I will say, uh, if I had to spend eight hours a month, I'd be very frustrated. <laughs> I will admit. I bet. I bet. Um, I've done it. I ran a 45 person SDR team at my last company and it would take me at least eight hours to do comp every, uh, every month. So, um, so this is one of those, and, and you'll see as we go through this presentation, there are a few kind of, I call them no duh, um, slides, which is like, it is what we would expect. Uh, the data lines up with what we would have expected and that's a good thing. Um, and so 50, 50 being the most common pay mix and 56% of the organizations that we surveyed said that their pay mix was 50-50. What I mean by pay mix is 
if your on-target earnings is say $100,000, your base salary is $50,000 and your expected variable or commission is $50,000 per year. I don't know, Ryan, if, if you have, have any background or, or any uh, advice when it comes to building these or whether 50-50 has just always been the right thing for you. For, for sales reps, definitely 50-50 makes the most sense. I mean, the math makes the most sense. It's like a very easy thing for, you know, when you think about quota to OTE ratios. I think the question really becomes, and I think we had a question about like customer success, AM plans uh, separate from sales. And, and yeah. to be clear, we definitely like support and can talk about those as well. Yeah. I think- Oh as, yeah, I should, have, I should have said, sorry, at the beginning, when we're talking about this, this is specifically around new business sales reps, individual contributors, new business sales reps. Yeah. Um, so this doesn't talk about CS or, or leadership. Right now, so. And as we as we get uh, as you get more into account management, renewals, churn, what have you, I think you tend to have people have what I've seen is a, a higher percentage of their um, OTEB base. You know, call it sixty five thirty five, seventy thirty, uh, because it's a less it's a less direct control over outcomes thing. And I think like the reason you give a 50, 50 variable for an individual, individual rep is because they have the, they have much more control on whether a deal closes or, or what happens or not. So you want to, if you give somebody 50, 50 variable, you want to give the people that who have the most like personal power and control over the outcomes. I would say. Yeah, absolutely. What's your take on 100% base salary as on target earnings? The, the uh, I, I think that the challenge for, for the, what I see, and when I've talked to companies who've done this, the challenge really is how do you understand who, especially with ramping reps, are top or not top performers? Um, that's how, that's how I, I, that's the biggest challenge I see. Like if you, and especially if you want to motivate, I mean, the people I typically talk to in a sales role are you know, compensation motivated. There's a slide we'll get to about yeah. that specifically. Uh, and so you can, it's hard to be a differentiated top performer um, if you have 100%. Uh, yeah, I agree. Uh, I, I agree. And, and every organization I talk to that says they have 100% base salary, there's some reason why it's not 100% base yeah. salary. They, they have bonuses or, or promotions or, or yeah. something around that. So um, more often than not, it's, it's not truly 100%. It, it just appears that way on paper. Hey, Graham, we got a question from Taylor that I'm just going to answer yeah. quickly. Uh, so Taylor, when we talk about OTE, we're talking about on target earnings. And what that means is if the uh, if the rep hit 100% attainment of their plan exactly. So if you have a 50K base and a 50K variable, their on target earnings would be 100K. If they sold exactly what they were intended to sell at their comp plan. So that's a OTE is as the comp plan is built, if they hit everything kind of exactly as planned, 100% attainment, this is where they would be. And that's how you model on target earnings. And the reason you use that and the reason you build that is because you want to keep an eye on your quota to on target earnings. So how much, how much they basically, we'll talk about this in a second, but like, what is their quota divided by their on target earnings and how does that scale for teams? Yeah, so absolutely. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks for answering that question. And on target earnings is, is a, a really often discussed topic. Um, I can I could talk all day about OTE and how to build it and and you know, whether it's attainable and whatnot. But uh, yeah, spot on there. Um, and so that's actually, uh, you talked about that quota to on target earnings ratio. And so that's, that's one of the major ways that organizations build their quotas is they take that on target earnings. Again, we're going to use that $100,000 so that I can do the math easily. You take that number and you multiply it by some other figure. And that will give you your annualized quota. Now, I'm not saying you, every quota should be an annual quota. In fact, we'll, we'll talk about that in a second. But so this actually increases, this ratio increases as the company's revenue grows. And so if you're in that zero to $5 million range, the average is a 4X. And in fact, in previous data I've seen, you know, zero to 1 million, it's actually closer to a 3X. So it, it ramps up rather quickly as you're, you're scaling your organization. But the reason why it, it ramps up like that is because you get more resources. You hire people like Ryan to do RevOps or um, you have your, your BDRs or more sales management or more enablement. And with each of those, it adds more cost to the salesperson. And because it adds more cost to the salesperson, they have to sell more in order to make up for it. The other thing I would say is you also, you know, as you move up your revenue scale, you've uh, established more product market fit too, right? So like selling you probably have more winds behind, like wind behind you and being able to sell deals as well. Right. So like yep. you're, 
you have more of an established marketing presence. You probably have more G2 reviews. You probably have more, te- you know, like things that are propellants outside of just a cost structure. Like it becomes, as your ARR grows, it becomes easy, you know, easier is the wrong, but like relative from a quarter to OT perspective, um, easier to hit higher multiples. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and it looks like Josh had a question about um, were the participants US centric? Uh, they were about 85% in the US. We do have uh, data outside of the US. Um, I'm happy to, if you want to ping me, I'm happy to do any additional analysis that um, you want on that for a specific area. But the data is a little bit more limited. So. Um, and then an interesting thing here is, is the, the SaaS to services. I, I often um, encounter this where somebody is moving from a services business where they have a $2 million a year quota to a SaaS business where it's a $600,000 quota or or whatever. And they often are shocked. Or I also talk to services companies who say like, well, this isn't fair. I can't compete with a $200,000 on target earnings when all they have to do is sell you know, a million dollars where for us, they'd have to sell 3 million. And that's, that's just the case between those industries. A lot of it is due to um, recurring services, or I'm sorry, recurring revenue from SaaS and the, um, the profit margins on those that SaaS has just drastically higher profit margins than the services generally. Um, so one of the things that I and Ryan are both very big proponents of is, is standardization of comp plans. And so we ran this survey in 2020 uh, and then again in 2022, we asked if, if folks standardize their comp plans. Now, that doesn't mean that every single person on your sales team has the, the same comp plan. That's, that's not what we mean. What we mean is that everybody in the same role has the same base salary on target earnings and quota. Um, and so you may have an account executive and a senior account executive and an enterprise account executive. And, and that's actually really highly encouraged. Um, so keep that in mind. This is more of standardizing the structure of your comp plan. And we saw 86% of, of organizations said that they do standardize that. And one of the really encouraging things from that is that it's up about 17% from 2020. So when we ran this in 2020, it was 69%. Now it's 86%. Um, I have a couple of theories about why that might be. But Ryan, I don't know if you want to talk a little bit about standardizing plans and the importance of that. Yeah, there's a couple of different drivers that are really important to us that we talk about here a lot. I mean, one is non-standard comp plans leave room for implicit bias against, you know, women, people of color, underrepresented, uh, underrepresented communities in a team, um, where if you have everybody in an account executive role, they all have uh, the same, you know, territory design, same comp plan. It just, you can better compare people based on their merit of, of the work they've actually done. I think the second thing really is, is that merit comparison piece where you can, if you have uh, if you give everyone a fair shot to win with balanced territories and then give them balanced round robins and then give them balanced comp plans, you become a much more attractive employer because you can just say, hey, here's the comp plan, here's attainment, here's how people are operating. I think the other piece that people, the other piece that's like tied into this is comp visibility within your org from your sales team. So our account executives, our account executive twos and our senior account executives, they all know what the OTEs are for every sales role in in their trajectory in the org. And why that's super important for us is because I want a uh, rep to be able to look at her path upward in the organization and not be surprised and you know think about, okay, versus switching costs to finding another job, I can continue to work well and continue to access higher OTE here uh, and have a very clear and unbiased path to it. So those are some of the big drivers for us. You've spent all this money to hire, train, and ramp a rep, uh, having them feel like they're fairly treated and trusted is massively important for us overall. Yeah, agreed. And, and um, you, a lot of it, you took the words right out of my mouth, which is which is wonderful. And and the one thing that I would add is is that track from an AE to an AE two to a senior AE, all of that should be very clearly laid out and very clearly based on job performance. Um, oftentimes I see like, oh, how do I get, pro-? you know, I, I'll ask people, how do you get promoted from an AE to an AE2? And they say, well, you know, you have to be a team player and you have to be, you have to, you know, understand the, the tool and you have to understand the industry. And I'm like, well, that, that sounds like just, you know, another way of keeping down people you don't like. Um, and instead what you should create, which is what Quotapath has and every other organization I've been a part of it has is, is a very clear expectation set of what it takes to get from an AE to an AE2 what it takes to get from an AE2 
to a senior AE. And it should be based on job performance and it should be based on um, you know, wh what you need to see out of them in order for them to move into the next role. So this is another one of those no duh slides, uh, which is wonderful. But uh, when you actually pay out reps, when do you, because you think about commissions, there are two steps of commissions. There's when you earn the commissions and when it's paid out. Now, in most organizations, when you earn the commission is based on when the, uh, when the deal closes. So you close the deal, you earn commissions on that. Now you may not be actually paid that, paid out that until some other trigger. So sub $25 million in revenue for a company, about a third of the time, it's actually when the invoice is paid. And there's this other, this other category as well, which may be when the onboarding is complete or when the invoice is sent or when the, the you know, whatever it may be. Um, but as your company grows, as you have more cash sitting in the bank, you move more towards the paying as soon as the deal closes uh, or, or you know, paying them as soon as the deal closes, but paying them on the next pay period after the deal closes. Hey, Graham, Jake had a question on uh, oh, yeah. if the survey considered revenue-based, like no quota compensation models, where you just talking to people who um, are just paid a percentage of any revenue they bring in and don't necessarily have a quota. I mean, we surveyed those, those people would be included. They just wouldn't have marked a quota to OTE ratio, correct? Because they don't have a quota, they wouldn't right. have a quota. Yeah, there was, a, there was a, an NA model uh, or an NA option as well. And so we did have some folks do that. And, and um you know, I see that this is, it's, you know, based a percent on the money that comes in from their closed deals. So that may also be, a, and Jake may have to connect offline, but um, like a usage-based model or a, a model where you sign a customer, they don't necessarily pay you anything up front, but over time you get paid by that customer. You know, you, you sign them up and they, every time they swipe a credit card, you get 3% of that. Or um, you know, every time they buy API calls, you get a percentage of, of, of that. Um, those are, yeah, so those, those, I see you've typed correct. So in those situations, what I think about is the, the like fully ramped, fully operational person when it comes to how much you expect for them to, how much revenue you expect for them to generate over the course of a 12 month period, as opposed to necessarily like closing a $10,000 deal. It may be, you know, a, on the 13th month of them working there, through the 24th month of them working there, how much revenue are they generating in that 12 month period? Because that would then kind of be considered their quota or their yeah. target. So that's that's how I would think about it for those usage-based folks. Yeah, and we've had a lot of cust uh, conversations with our customers, you know, in financial services and data storage and um, e-com and other places who, who have these types of models. And they definitely make total sense. To, to Graham's point, you won't call it a quota because it's not like deal side, but you do in your mind have I would imagine some sort of like, you know, financial model that says I expect this person to drive, you know, this many terabytes of increased storage or uh, this many transactions on the platform or this many dollars of credit card spend. So you can think of that relative to being quote unquote a quota. Um, it's just not going to probably fit in a, you know, SaaS model quota to OT. Like it'll be different because it's not on revenue they're closing. It's on you're copying them on some other sort of transactionable item like data or something like that. Yep, exactly. Um, so when thinking about quota frequency, because we said that, that that quota OTE multiplier is the annualized quota. So now the three most common quota periods that we see are monthly, quarterly, and annual. And as you can see within here, overall quarterly is, is the most common. It makes up the 40% uh, uh, most of the time here. But there are a couple of things that determine how often you want to measure the, the quota of your reps. So one is the average sales price, the average contract value, whatever you want to call it here. Um, if you're on a, on a very small ASP, less than $10,000, then more often than not, you're on a monthly quota. As, you, as your ASP increases, you're going to fall more to a quarterly and eventually more to a, an annual plan. And same goes for the sales cycle. If you're a sub one month sales cycle, more often than not, you're going to be on monthly, followed by quarterly, followed by annually as the uh, sales cycle increases in duration. And a lot of times those two are connected. So uh, the longer your or the higher your ASP, the longer your sales cycle. Um, 
now we're going to get into a fun part of building those comp plans. Who builds those comp plans? Um, and the way that we think about comp plan building, there are the person who owns it or the person who's responsible for it. And then there who's who's involved within it. And we'll talk a little bit about that because as you'll see later on, the more organizations you involve, the better off you are. But really small sales teams, generally the sales leadership is the, the one building it. As you scale up your sales team, it shifts to RevOps and finance. Ryan, I know this is going to be a loaded question, but who do you think should own uh, comp plan building? <laughs> so what I will say is uh, I think RevOps acts as a healthy mediator in the process. I think that's kind of, um, we actually, when we built comp plans last, we, we have a very healthy and great comp plan designing process, much, much better than ones I've been in the in past, um, for sure. And I think, I mean, Owning is an interesting word because you want everybody's input very clearly. Like what are financial constraints? What are, what are motivators for your reps? What is going to be implemented easily and transparent to the team? So I, you know, we're going to get to the, all three people being, or even four plus people being very deeply involved is, is super helpful. Um, I think RevOps has an ability to take a, a, a neutrality, like both from cost and motivation and drive uh, kind of the, the best outcomes from, from what I've seen. Yeah. I always say that finance wants to pay reps as little as possible and sales wants to pay reps as much as possible. And RevOps is a good intermediary there. And so yeah. that actually brings us to one of the one of the more interesting slides that I came across. So it says comp plan designed by sales leadership are the most trusted. And that's true on average. If you look at the average weighting, you know, you say, hey, very confident is a five, not at all confident is a one. And you average at, that out. And we do have a slide that, next that, that shows that um, style. But it actually tells a, a much different story here. What we see is that finance has almost the entirety of the plans built by finance fall in that somewhat confident or confident range. Um, there are very few where they're very confident and very few where they're unconfident and actually none where they're not at all confident. And so it's very like middle of the road. Finance is, is generally a good at building like a fine comp plan. Whereas RevOps, <laughs> it's very hit or miss. You have the highest likelihood of being very confident and also the highest likelihood of being very unconfident. And so I think that that, that goes to the, the point about like, they can be an intermediary, but what can often happen is they try to please everybody. They try to please the, the finance team. They try to please the sales leadership team and end up building this overly complicated mess of a plan. Um, or if they don't try to please everybody, they take everybody's input. That's how you get it. But, you know, and consider the input and build their own plan out of it. That's how you get those very confident ones. Um, sales leadership is somewhere in between the two. So, um, however, to Ryan's point, the more departments you involve, the confidence increases. So if, if it's just one department going out there and building the plan themselves, the average confidence is a 3.1. Um, you add in another department, it becomes a 3.2. You add in a third department, and it actually increases to a 3.5. And so the, the confidence increases as you add each of these departments. But to Ryan's point about, you know, you said four departments, maybe. What I don't have in here, uh, which I, I need to add in, I guess, is once you add the fourth department, the confidence actually drops back down to, to about the same as it is with, if one department is in there. And so there is a too many cooks in the kitchen. Yeah, yeah. This. I think one of the things, so the confidence thing is really interesting. I think one of the pieces of advice that has gone really well for us uh, and has been, it's been going on over the past couple of months as we do our comp planning for next year is like ask the reps their opinion. You know, you're not promising anything. You're not saying, okay, I'm going to definitely do X, Y, or Z, but ask reps their opinion. Like, do you, what do you think about the comp plan? What are the things you like? What are the things you don't like? What are motivating? And like, have that be a variable in your process that you weigh alongside sales leader needs, you weigh alongside um, finance needs. And what's really helpful is giving giving the rep, if you can, like what is a win that the reps asked for that you can bake into a comp plan? No matter the size, like no matter the, 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 you know, example is we were on, for a good portion of our team, we were on monthlies and we switched to quarterly for some, because we were having some longer deal cycles. You know, that was something that reps really explicitly asked for because they were, I'm working some of these longer deals that are 45, 60 days, and I want to see them to fruition and completion, right? And so that's something that we weighed and we like brought into our process and navigated and, and rolled out. And it's been very successful for us thus far. And so giving 
team members, like knowing that they're being heard and giving them those quick wins in your comp plans is super, super important. Um, still, you want to build the ideal comp plan for your business, but pulling their thought process into it is uh, it's just a very helpful thing for your team overall. Um, yeah, I, yeah. I do these comp plan consults. I've never once had somebody say, can I bring an AE on this call with me um, yeah. you know, to, to hear their input? Because... And, and I think you should, you absolutely should involve that. I, I just, I do a, a LinkedIn live series plug for uh, for sales nerds live, my podcast slash LinkedIn live series. Um, and I, just this week I interviewed two of our AEs and asked them about like how often they're involved and how they think about comp plans. And really they, they before quota path weren't really involved at all. And now they feel like they have them. The other thing I would say is I think the, I think finance can sometimes be billed as a little bit of a villain in comp plan design. And I think that what is helpful for that and where RevOps can be really helpful in that conversation is talking to the reps explicitly about like what the financial constraints are for the business and like why those decisions are being made. You know, if you think about something like, um, uh, call it like reducing churn as an example for like an account manager comp plan. And you say, hey, look, like a good portion, you know, our customers I was talking to, like a good portion of your book is on monthly contracts. And so you have to have a higher churn floor because if we don't, then we're going to continue to lose. Like if you lose 5% of your monthly ARR month over month, you blink and by 12 months, you're at 50%. So like laying out a little bit of the math of like, I'd love to do this for you. I'd, I'd, it'd be great to do this. But like, here's the economics of the business and really to give the reps confidence, especially in this market of so much termination and layoffs and what have you that like you're trying to build a comp plan that helps them out, but also protects the health of the business long term for employment and what have you. Like, I think if you lay out that thought process in a really thoughtful way, it can be a much better conversation than, oh, you know, finance doesn't want to pay me more money. Right. I'm be, you know, like that, that narrative that I, I yeah. it's a bit tired to me. And I think that like there's a really good opportunity to actually bring the strategic thinking from finance into these conversations much more. Yeah. And I mean, a perfect example of, of where we've been seeing this more and more is so we ask, you know, what what modifies your commission rates? Essentially, do you, what has an accelerator or a decelerator quota attainment? 80 percent. That's consistent across from 2020 through to today. Same for the, the different products sold. The one that has actually changed quite a bit over the past couple of years is contract length. So this is this was about 20 percent, 25 percent in our last survey. And it's almost doubled in that period of time. And. What this means is you get paid, you know, maybe you get paid 10% 10 of the ARR if you close a one-year deal. You get paid 15% of the ARR if you close a two-year deal. Um, that's becoming more and more common. And a lot of that is, is due to, to finance reasons. Yeah, finance, people are happy to pay you more commission if you are able to lock that revenue in for longer. Um, and so I the finance paying perhaps as little as possible is truly a joke, I promise. Um, but what it... what the truth is, is that they want to pay you for the things that actually mo move the needle for the business. Yeah. And, and something like that, like contract length, that can be for your AEs and your sales team. That can be for your account managers on renewal. You can, you know, give them additional points if they convert a contract from a two-year to a three-year contract. Like you can use something like that. That's always beneficial for your business, right? As something to motivate everybody in your cycle, um, which is great. I mean, and there's like other... You know, you can play with one. If you think about other things that are good for your business, you can play with one off spiffs for NPS scores. You can play for spiffs for uh, rev like review, like positive reviews on sites. Like all, you can play with all this sort of stuff that here's the net thing that's good for the business. And here's the thing that's the rep is excited about. And like driving that together is very valuable. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, another off one that I often see is um, extra commission percentages for closing deals earlier in the quarter or yeah. earlier in the month, um, because then it, allows you to better have have more consistency across the quarter or the month. There are some issues with that that I won't get into now where you could sandbag and kick a deal into the following month if you knew you're going to get a higher percentage on it. But that's a, a perfect example of how you might be able to play with those those different components. Um, so the other stat that is, again, scary here, 90% of, of sales leaders don't trust their comp structure. So a couple of things that you can do here when it comes to increasing the confidence. So as we saw before, I'm going to flip back a few slides. One is involving more departments in your in your plan building. Um, one is being on this call, which is great because now you'll be more confident in building it. Um, but another is 
the distribution or, or how often you're coming up with a new comp plan. So this is this says how often they're distri distributed. Really what it means is how, how often you roll out a new comp plan. Do you roll out a new comp plan structure every quarter or do you do it every six months or is it every year? And if you want to increase confidence, build it right, build it the first time. And if you need to make small, small tweaks throughout the year using those spiffs that Ryan mentioned or just stomaching through it and, and uh, changing the plan the following year is more likely to increase the confidence in, in your comp plans. Yeah, I see a yikes every quarter. I agree. I, uh, I, I feel bad for those folks. <laughs> now, this isn't to say, like, don't ever change your comp plans. Of course not. Like, that's 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 ridiculous, especially for really, really early on companies. You need to have that flexibility to know that the comp plan today is not the comp plan we're going to need six months from now. So if you need to change those plans, you need to change them. But the, the but you know, focus on making sure that you're building it right so that you don't have to change it every quarter. The other thing I would say is you don't have to change as much pressure test uh, the like major outliers of performance and what that would mean. You know, if a rep came in and closed a $3 million deal, I would be thrilled to pay her the amount of rep. Like we don't cap commissions. I feel very strongly against cap commissions, whole separate conversation. Um, but I would be thrilled to pay her whatever rate she earned on a $3 million deal. Um, know that if you build a comp plan, like know that what is the, and combine your rates. Like what is rep signs a three year uh, multi-product, you know, you know, what bundled deal, right. what is like at her accelerator, right? Like, yeah. you know, she's, you know, uh, over a quarter. Or you're earning 40% on this deal or whatever. Exactly. Yeah. But like know that, right? And very explicitly in your planning process, like go through that and know what you would, what would happen uh, and know, just sign off and say like, I'd be thrilled and go to your, go to your VP of finance and say, if this deal comes, what are you going to pay for it? And if they say no, then figure that out before you build a comp plan. Like that, a lot of the times when I see comp plans changed, they're changed because the person didn't uh, test the outliers early on. Like that's where I see a lot of them change. Yeah, it's like warning labels on things. You anytime you see a warning label, it's because somebody did that, and that's yes. how a lot of comp plan changes are. It's like it's like oh, you know, unless you close a million dollar deal because we had one person do this. And yeah. I actually wrote a blog post a while back about Bluebird deals um, and. I've also written blog posts on capped commission. Both of those are, but Bluebird deals meaning, you know, your $3 million deal that comes out of nowhere or whatever um, and how to handle those. And it's essentially pay it. And if you didn't like paying it, make sure you uh, change the comp plan to so that you don't have to pay it again. Oh yeah. Thank you, Kelly, for linking that. So this again is, is a slightly self-serving one, but uh, the more, or, but reps trust their commissions if they are built in, uh, software as opposed to in spreadsheets. You know, if you're calculating your commissions in spreadsheets, reps aren't as, as confident that they're getting paid properly, which as we saw is a, a, an issue for sure. Um, the other thing is that confidence in commissions increases when reps understand their comp plan. So this is a little bit of a hard one to read, but essentially what we looked at was reps who said that they were very confident um, in their comp plan they gave an average of 4.35 that their commissions are correct. Whereas people who are not confident that they have the right comp plan or they understand their comp plan, they only give a 3.25 that, that uh, their commissions are correct. So if your reps, if you have a simple plan, easy to understand, your reps get it, they're more likely to, to believe that their commissions are correct and honestly, more likely to get paid correctly and therefore stick around. Yeah, I mean, the biggest question is like, could your rep explain their comp plan to their mother, or grandmother, friend, mailman, whatever? Um, and we talk about like three topping rule on a pizza a lot. Like, don't have more than three variables in your comp plan. Like, there's there's a lot. I think a lot of right now is a really good time to think through. Like, if you wrote your comp plan from scratch and only had three rules, could you do it? And I think for most orgs, the answer is yes, uh, if you're really critical of it. And like, we're happy to talk more about, I think Graham, you've done a couple where you've whittled down like 19, 20 rules to like two rules, three yeah. rules before, like it can be done for sure. Yeah, for sure. And and it's incredibly important. We'll talk about this slide here in a second. I just, I wanted to get it up there because I love it so much. Um, but yeah, you're absolutely right. It, 
more often than not, you could be replacing those earnings rules with behavior changes, or it's things that reps are already doing, or you could coach them on this, or you could create other rules for this. The ones that I, I hate are like, I see, I saw a plan a while back that had um, your commission rate was dependent upon your average contract value size. Now, what that did is that caused people to only focus on their big deals. And in fact, I remember a rep saying, well, I don't want to close this tiny deal at the end of the quarter, because it's actually going to bring my average contract value down to the point where I'm going to lose money by closing this deal. So I'm going to walk away from this deal, ghost this person, because if I close it, I'm going to earn less commission. And so that's the type of behavior that like, instead of focusing on paying them based on their average contract value, why don't you give them the tools and give them the training for them to increase that contract value? Yeah, there's, I mean, there's some parts of, I think people sometimes mistake comp plans for like being good at your job. You know, like the, some people like put things, you know, performance of the job. Yes, comp is going to be incredibly important, but like some people put things in comp plans that are like trying to guide people towards being like, the, you know, the quote unquote, the right type of employee, yeah. uh, which is just, you know, there's other, you have a sales leader, you have people to coach your reps, like you have other mechanisms. Um, you know, some people have comp plans based on like percentage of meeting, team meetings attended or like just comical stuff like that, where it's like, you do not need to be that punitive uh, for things like that, that are just like org culture things. Yeah, exactly. And this is, again, this, this is actually the last slide on the, uh, on the deck, but this is that 86% of reps rank compensation as their top priority when job hunting. So we ask them to rank different uh, things that they look at when looking at a new job. And 86% of reps put compensation as the, the number one. And so this goes to, building the right comp plan and the transparency around those comp plans to make sure that you're actually talking about this, talking about it early in the recruiting process, talking about you know, putting it on the job posting. It gives you a competitive advantage as you're hiring and, and retaining that talent. Um, so let's do this real quick. I'm going to pull up a uh, pull up stop presenting for a second and pull up a different tab. And we're going to talk through compensation hub, which is what we pulled up before. Uh, ba -ba -bum, here we are. Cool. So we are able to, uh, to see compensation hub here. Awesome. Um, so compensation hub again is, is a, I guess it, it describes it up here. It's a platform to discover, compare, build, and customize compensation models. So we have 15 plans in here right now centered around account executives and sales development reps. We have a lot more plans coming soon, actually like very, very soon. Within the next week or so, we have more plans coming, and then we're going to continually be adding more and more plans. Um, and what this does is, is it gives you a modeler, meaning it's not just a list of plans. So let's let's actually pop into one and I, I can tell you exactly what I mean by this. It's not just a list of plans that tells you what a commission with accelerators plan looks like. It actually allows you to modify it based on specifics about your business. So say your on target earnings isn't 140, it's $133,000. Again, it gives you that base variable pay mix of 50-50 by default, but it also allows you to change this. So if you're not at a 50-50, if you're one of those folks at a 60-40, you can change that. It also then gives you more detail down here around that company revenue. So say we're, we are less than 1 million. So this then allows you to plug in a different quota to OTE ratio. So maybe we're at a 4X here. Um, and then all of these details change. So the annualized quota changes based on that. Um, we can also enter in the average contract value, which we saw that we saw the annual contract value of, of you know, for example, five thousand dollars there. You're more likely to be on a on a monthly quota period. Um, and then what happens down below is the earnings rules actually change. So this allows you to enter in you know, the, the different quoted OTE ratio and it changes the earnings rule. So instead of 10% commission, you're looking at 12 and a half percent. It gives you accelerators and there are a bunch of different options for different plans. If we head back, you can see all the different options for all the different plans. Um, this is a completely free to use tool. You don't even need to, it's not even gated. So you don't even have to like enter in your email address. You just head to comp.quotapath.com and you can see all of the, uh, all the different plans that we currently have and, Keep your eyes peeled for additional plans that are coming soon.
what's pretty cool about this is if you build a comp plan here and you're like, oh, I really like this. I want to see how it works with yeah. my data or what have you. You can actually create like a quota path workspace for free off of it, sync your CRM, sync Salesforce, HubSpot, what have you, um, and see how it looks like with your own data too. So it's kind of taking the quote unquote like mortgage calculator style, like uh, here's some of the data about what a plan looks like and actually seeing it against your data, which is, which yeah. is pretty cool. Um, yeah, good call out. So I actually already have a workspace, of course, but I can click that and it will then create the plan for me here. And I can um, sync my, my CRM right here, as you see. So good call out. Or you can share it. We also have that share button. So you can click the share button. Um, it copies a unique link with all of the attributes that you already entered in. And you can share that out to people in your organization or you know, people in RevOps Co-op or what have you, if you want to share that. Cool. Excellent. Any other, well, any other questions you have? We, we can definitely have some more questions. Yeah, I, I know we have uh, we have about 15 minutes left. And... No questions in the chat. So Ryan, how can how can folks find you if they want to uh, if they want to connect? Yeah, uh, pretty active on LinkedIn. Uh, please reach out uh, right here. I'm happy to talk comp design whenever. Oh, Josh has a question. I think okay. Josh is typing that right now. Okay. <laughs> yep. But yeah, I'm, I'm on, I think LinkedIn in the chat. There and, and I can uh, I can send my LinkedIn as well, although I think it's in the uh, in the chat or in the in there already. I think you can click on it on me, but you can feel free to um, add me on LinkedIn as well. But we're vamping while Josh is typing here. No rush, Josh. Don't worry, we've got time. Oh yeah, yes, we're also fun. in we're in Roscoe for sure. And I don't know if anybody saw, but uh, what I've been doing here is snapping off little pieces of uh, dog treat and tossing it behind me because my dogs are getting antsy and they want to. Uh, they they said, "Okay, you've been you've been talking too much." So I uh, I did. Th I thought I heard them kind of wailing a little. Yep, bit. that was Lily starting to whine there. I, uh, she's yeah. the one who's typically not the whiner, so that was uh, that was a little frustrating, but that's all right. <laughs> uh, it's that's why I keep a jar of dog treats, a whole jar of dog treats on my desk, just in case. All right, we've got two, uh, several kickers on comp plans for things, including some optimal payment terms and frequency, but want to move away from a model where we limit it that via management. Yeah, I mean, Josh, the, what I would recommend is identifying the ones that you think are really moving the needle when it comes to compensation. And, and really are, are the most important ones that you want to focus your compensation on. And so it may be payment terms, or it may be payment frequency, or it may be, you know, whatever that is, where you think that's actually having an impact. And sometimes it, it's not even having an impact at all. You know, people are just powering through and, and offering monthly payments, no matter what. That, those are the ones where if it's not actually having an impact, then take it out. And instead, give a, a standardized rate and focus on coaching those, focus on creating rules around it where you have to have approval or they have to have a business case for monthly. Um, and, you know, I, honestly, it, it, it may come to a headcount issue if the, if, or a sales culture issue. If your reps are still not doing it, um, then it may be time to, to do a reset on the, the sales culture. The other thing I would say is uh, really think about which ones of those are explicitly in the ref's control versus not. Um, so if you have one, you know, we, if you think about something like um, fr payment frequency, like monthly, annual, you know, qu monthly, quarterly, annual, what have you. The question is, can you flip that comp plan to motivate really good, good behavior? Like instead of having it be a decelerator for something um punitive can you have an accelerator for like great behavior so locking in you know annual payment up front or two-year payment up front like flip the mentality of it to motivate reps so that they wouldn't ever want to offer you know subpar payment terms or something like that so it's kind of flipping it a little bit like how do you give if if you're going to keep it how do you give the rep the opportunity to be excited about the inverse action versus just bummed about the you know the action that's bad for business yeah for sure and um there's a book uh, predictably irrational by Dan Ariely, where he talks a lot about like um, ownership bias and how people, if you give somebody $20 and then flip a coin and if it's head, 
heads, they keep the $20. And if it's tails, you take 10 of it away versus giving them $10 and you flip a coin. And if it's heads, you give them an extra $10. And if it's tails, you don't get an extra $10. The outcome is the exact same regardless. But people have very different reactions to it and very different opinions of, of those two outcomes. And so that's what Ryan means there, where like, maybe you want it to be a, like, maybe you do want some to be punitive. Like, um, you know, hey, if you sign a monthly deal, you're going to get minus four commission, commission percentage points uh, on this deal. Or it could be not a punitive, it, it's, it's a reward where you say, if you sign an annual deal, you get four additional bonus points. It's the exact same outcome, but a lot of times with reps, it, it has a much different um, meaning and a much different interpretation for them. But Josh, if you want to, if you want to connect um, about that further, I'm happy to, uh, to take a look and, and see if there's anything that, that I would recommend. Excellent. Well, everyone really, really appreciate your time. Um, Aaron, unless there's anything else on your end, I think we are uh, good to go. Nope. Just a reminder that we will put this up on the website, on socials, on our newsletter in a couple of weeks, so everybody can have it and hold it forever and ever. Um, somebody asked earlier if the um, if the slides themselves would be shared. I can certainly share the slides. Um, we actually are in the process of um, turning these slides into a, uh, a, a page on our website. Again, it's not going to be a downloadable resource where you have to enter in your email address and it gives it, it's going to all be completely ungated. Um, that I believe should be out within the next week or so. Um, so I can send that out, but I'm happy to share the slides with you as well, Aaron, if, if you want to post those uh, in the. Yeah. Uh, yeah, we can post it with the article. And thank you guys for your time today. Thank you all for coming and we will see you around in the